and we are live how's it going everyone welcome back to the punch perfect boxing channel before we get going today please make sure to like the video comment your prediction for this fight down below and if you are new please make sure to subscribe to the channel today i'm doing my punch perfect prediction for hecky budler versus elwin soto in the wbc final eliminator at light flyweight live this saturday night in mexico it'll be tough to find a, a way to watch this fight but if you are on the wonderful world of boxing twitter I'm sure someone will sort you out as they always do, so keep an eye out on there. I'm really looking forward to this fight and I wanted to talk about it today for a number of reasons. First and foremost, light flyweight has been my favourite division over the last couple of years. As you guys know, I'm a big fan of the uh, the 108 division and you guys like it when I do predictions because you guys comment and say perhaps you've not been exposed to it before and you like staying up to date with it but you kind of you need some direction so hopefully I can I can do that in these videos. Um, last year it was the division of upsets, I've mentioned it many times on the channel, Canazales got beat, um, we saw Ken Shiro get beat, we saw Soto get beat, we saw Guy Gucci not look great, but this year it feels like everything's being put right. Uh, Ken Shiro got his belts back from Masamichi Yabuki and looked tremendous in that fight, looked like a man on a mission. Now wants a unification against the guy that he's fighting for, for the top dog in the division, which is Hiroto Guy Gucci, who looked spectacular recently in dismantling Esteban Bermudez. It's just a really good division that is now thriving once again. Felix Alvarado recently vacated the IBF belt, so we're going to see uh, Non Shingo going in for the, the vacant title, which I think is really exciting. Uh, we're going to see Daniel Matilon, who's the interim WBA champion, get his shot at some point. And now we get these two guys, a former world champion um, in Elwin Soto, who only lost his belt last year, and Hecky Budler, who's one of the stalwarts of the lower weight categories i'm going to talk a little bit more about him but a former two weight world champion this is a really good crossroads matchup budler the more experienced man in his mid 30s and he's looking to uh to sort of sign off in style now at this stage and just take big fight after big fight if he can get them whereas i think for for soto it's a very worrying time if he was to lose this weekend he would start to become a bit more of an opponent than a contender as a former champion, you want to prove that you can get back to the top. If he were to lose this fight, you would see him drop down from contendership and be put into the sort of category as world-level opponent and guys that are looking to promote their guys and get them ready for the world stage. Soto will just be drafted in as an opponent. So it's a really important matchup for both men. I'm going to start off by talking about um, Hecky Butler because... It's a name that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with, even if you don't follow the lower weight categories, because he's really been a stalwart of that division over the last 10 or so years, maybe even longer. Um, I think when I first heard of him would have been around the 2009 time. And the first time I heard about him was actually in Boxing News. They did a, an interview and a feature on him. He just picked up the IBO All Africa title and they were sort of uh, talking about him in there. He'd had his hair, uh, the colour of the, the South Africa flag. So, you know, he was he was getting some exposure. He was well supported in South Africa. So I've known about him for a very long time. And the lower weight categories for around that sort of time period was tough to follow for a lot of people. The belts were sort of in Japan, Thailand, a little bit of Mexico, you'd see Puerto Rico, the Philippines as well, but mainly Thailand and Japan were sort of the, the two countries that dominated those weight categories. It really took Chocolatito to come through um, and make that division, those divisions fashionable and get involved in some big fights and get those fights on HBO and we now see them on zone. You know, it, it was Chocolatito that changed things, but before that, Hecky Butler was the man that was just chipping away and trying to trying to get the shine on those on those divisions that he felt it deserved. Fighting at 105, fighting at 108, the two smallest divisions, you know, not two historically deep divisions either, but he was the guy that was chipping away. So I think when it gets to the end of his career, he hasn't had a Hall of Fame worthy career, but when you think of someone that's just been a tremendous servant to the sport and someone you'd like to see be, a men be mentioned in esteemed company, I think Hecky Budler's one of those fighters. Good guy as well, and I like to support South African fighters because I, I've been lucky enough to feature quite regularly on South African, South African radio to talk about fights and stuff. So, yeah, Hecky Budler is a guy that gets a lot of respect in, in my book. And, you know, looking at his career, he's held world championships at two weight classes. So he held the IBO and the WBA at 105 minimum weight, and then he moved up and he won the IBO, the WBA and the IBF. He unified the WBA and the IBF. A light flyweight and that wasn't too long ago that was 2018 so 
he's been around for many years, fought at two weight categories, as most fighters tend to do down at those lower weight classes. In terms of, you know, his best wins, he's had, for the large part of his career, fighting for that IBO title at both weights, a kind of lesser respectable um, type of opposition. He was also sort of regarded as not perhaps not being the most entertaining to watch at times as well. But he just kept chipping away and kept winning, suffered a defeat at 105 for the IBO belt, but then moved up. And when he did move up, he got the best win of his career against uh, Ryuchi Taguchi uh, for Japan, who was a unified champion, WBA, IBF world champion. And he rocked up and took the belts from him in Japan. Biggest win of his career. He got hurt and he got dropped late on. But he got enough of a lead and battled hard over in Japan and, and away soil to get the victory. One of the best wins of, of 2018 and the best win of his career. Off the back of that, he got offered an opportunity to go and fight Hiroto Gaiguchi, who we've obviously mentioned is the number one at light flyweight at the minute. And he took a bit of a pace in, in that fight. The levels were quite clear, in my opinion. I thought he hung in there. He was no means completely outclassed, but he did sort of suffer sort of some damage towards the later end of the fight, and it ended up being stopped late on. Since then, he's returned with a, a WBC silver title and a 12-rounder, but that's been his only fight since. That was in 2021, so it's been over a year now. And yeah, not been particularly active, but I think a lot of South African fighters have struggled with that a little bit, getting fights overseas. So yeah, you know, he's a, a very decorated fighter, been around for a very long time. If you haven't seen him before, not a particularly big puncher, doesn't punch particularly hard at all, but he's just a nuisance. He's relentless, he constantly comes forward, he likes to target the body more than anything else. He throws from unorthodox angles, he's just persistent. He's technically flawed, but you know what you're going to get with him. I wouldn't say he has a the world's greatest chin because we've seen him hurt and dropped before, but I think he's iron willed rather than iron chinned. He's very tough to def tough to deter, and he's very hard to make respect your power. He's just happy to walk through it and keep coming. So limited, but also a nightmare and a nuisance to try and deal with for twelve rounds if you can't lay him out. So a very well rounded, efficient fighter in my opinion. We'll move over now to Elwin Soto, who not in his mid-30s, is in his mid-20s. He was kind of seen as one of the hottest prospects in Mexican boxing at one point. When he won the title from Acosta, you actually saw on the zone that he got really good numbers on the on the YouTube highlights and stuff, and it performed really well. So DeZone were keen to keep pushing him, Golden Boy and DeZone. And obviously Eddie Hearn drafted him in for a Canelo card as well, so they're keen to build on him. And now all of that has gone out the window. And I don't think it's all that surprising, to be honest. Um... All, his first 15 fights before he fought for the world title, all but one had been in Mexico, so there's not a lot to take from those. And then he stepped up for a world title fight, and it's worth mentioning he'd suffered a defeat early on in his career as well, only a full rounder though. He went in against um, Ankel Acosta, who, as we all know, one of the most dangerous punchers in boxing, and at the time was the most dangerous puncher in the light flyweight weight category. He was the WBO champion. And in that fight, Elwin Soto came out and looked quite impressive early on. He actually dropped Acosta, hurt him as well in the following round early on. And, you know, looked like the fight was going to go his way, but just took his foot off the pedal, was unable to build consistent attacks, got troubled himself by Acosta, who kept pushing him back and, and having him up against the ropes, which isn't Soto's domain, so he was being outfought. And going into the final round, Acosta had a healthy lead on all of the cards. Um, but the fight resulted in a stoppage. So I managed to hurt him, started to push him back. And the referee jumped in with 23 seconds to go. And it was highly controversial because Soto was behind on the cards. There was 23 seconds left. We kind of felt that Acosta probably could have got through it. And even with a knockdown was ahead on all the cards, would have been able to get the decision despite losing the 12th. But the referee jumped in and it was highly controversial. But regardless, he had his moments in that fight and proved that he could probably hang at world level. It was what happened subsequently after that where you start to really look at Soto's resume and you start to you start to nitpick a little bit and you start realizing that the guy is not as not as good as everyone made out because DAZN and ESPN and uh, companies like that were having him in like the best 25 fighters under 25 and I didn't think he warranted it personally especially when you look at some of the company um, he went on to to face uh, Carlos Butrego. Again, Butrego is someone that's been beaten in every significant fight that he's ever had. He's been stopped by Sandoval. Um, he just he gets beat when he steps up to the top level. 
Now he stepped up against Soto and he went the distance and he took quite a lot of rounds off him. A lot of people felt that, you know, it was a really competitive matchup. That for me was a bit of a warning sign when you when you look at things. Um, even his first defence, where you look at his fight against Edward Haino, that fight was highly controversial and a lot of people felt Haino won the fight. He buzzed uh, Soto, also scored a flash knockdown as well. So that was really close. So that's two defences where you really saw some warning signs that perhaps this guy isn't the goods. You then also saw him step up, as I mentioned, on the Canelo undercard against Billy Joe Saunders in Texas, where he took on uh, Katsunari Takayama, who, again, who's one of the ancient wonders of the lower weight classes, a real Japanese legend of the sport, but undersized for Soto and hadn't fought in a 12-rounder since 2016. So it was five years since his last significant fight. That says a lot, and the fact that Soto struggled in that fight to build any real attacks. I know he got the stoppage, but that was premature. If you remember, uh, Takayama started doing like front flips and dancing in the ring afterwards and press-ups to prove he was fine. Again, there was just so many warning signs with Soto that this guy just isn't elite. Finally, the night he lost his world title last October was when he stepped in against uh, Jonathan Gonzalez of Puerto Rico. I backed heavily Jonathan Gonzalez to win that fight with the bookies and in any videos I did I said I think Johnny Gonzalez is going to beat this man because Gonzalez basically did an errors landy Lara just went on the back foot played it safe as a southpaw just picked his shots outboxed him didn't take any risks whatsoever if Soto doesn't want to force a pace on me I'm not going to force a pace on him I'll just box really slow in an uninteresting boring fight and all three judges scored that 116-112 it could have been 120, 108 in all honesty because Soto had no success and no sustained attacks at all throughout the fight. So for me, it was very one-sided. Soto's now lost his belt, but what type of fighter is he? He's a guy that when he lets his hands go, looks dangerous and can really punch. He, he puts his combinations together really nicely. Someone once referred to him as a mini Canelo and whilst that's a massive stretch, when you often see Canelo put some combinations together, the uppercuts through the middle, followed up with a right hand and the way it sort of switches from body to head, you can see those elements. And Soto, when he gets in the positions, does let his hands go and look quite look quite uh, good in doing so. He just doesn't do it enough. He gets in all the right positions to let his hands go, but he just doesn't. And sometimes I think it's a case of he doesn't have a good enough jab or he's not able to set up the shots. But often enough, it's just not him pulling the trigger. For a guy that likes to be on the front foot and press the action and likes to be the guy that has the upper hand in that aspect, just doesn't let his hands go. And if he wants to win this weekend or make a career of it at the championship level at light flyweight or even if he moves up, he has to start letting his hands go much more and just take some risks. If you don't land, fair enough, but it forces a pace on your opponent. He tries to land the perfect combination all the time and you just can't do that, especially against a fighter that accepts that Okay, well, I'll just I'll just take advantage of that then and just play it safe on the back foot, like Jonathan Gonzalez did. So Soto's in a really tricky position this weekend. He simply has to go out there and win, otherwise his career at the top is done. Don't get me wrong, in the lower weight classes, and I always say this, guys get recycled all the time, and guys can win in a couple of years, guys can pull off upsets. It happens way more in the lower weight classes than anywhere else. But you do have to look at this and think, no one's really going to take a hit on him if he if he's going to go out there and lose this weekend. So how do I see the fight playing out? Um, pretty much, I think Hecky Butler has it all to do. Not so much in terms of ability, because I think he can win the fight in terms of his ability, um, in terms of his experience as well. I think he's faced probably a slightly... Slightly better level of opposition at the top end. I'd say Soto is probably a little bit more well-rounded with the Hinos, uh, the Butrego, um, Acosta, uh, Gonzalez. He's probably fought four better names, but the one and two in Teguchi and Guy Gucci that uh, Butler has fought is probably a little bit above that. So I'd say that, you know, Butler has the experience. He has the ability to win this fight. But I think the issue here is, and I hate to bring this into the argument, but you have to accept it. The fight is in Mexicali, which is where Soto is from. It's where he resides. The promoter is Zampha Promotions, which is Soto's promotional company. They're hosting the show and the card. It is a WBC final eliminator for Ken Shiro's world title. And the winner of this against Ken Shiro is a brilliant fight as well, especially if it's Budla, in my opinion. Um, 
yeah, the WBC is the governing body that's involved in this. Butler's never won any version of the WBC title. He's always gone down other routes. The WBC tend to favourite favor Mexican fighters. Elwin Soto is a Mexican fighter on a Mexican promotion show in Mexico. I just have a feeling that Butler could win eight rounds here and not get the decision. So in terms of the matchup and how it'll actually play out, if I take that aside, I think you look at Elwin Soto and you say, OK, Elwin Soto can be outworked in parts and doesn't let his hands go. Butler outworks his opponents and always lets his hands go. You'd think Butler would outwork him then, right? So I think for the most part, Butler will outwork him. However, I think Soto will have bigger moments in the fight. He may stun Butler. He may land big, hard shots. He's also been an active Butler, so maybe he gets caught cold a little bit early on as well. He maybe even get put down. I think Soto will have bigger and more memorable moments in the fight. But in terms of who won more rounds and who won more minutes and who, who had more control over the fight, I think Butler will. So I think this is going to be a fight where many of us feel Butler probably grinds out a decision. But over in Mexico, I think he has to win 10, 11 rounds. Even recently, watching that Guy Gucci Bermudez fight, Guy Gucci was the promotional fighter on that card. And the home fighter Bermudez got the rub of the green on the card with the referee. Guy Gucci had to lay him out to be able to get that done. I think we're going to see something similar here where Butler just gets hard done by, which is a real shame because his career deserves another big fight against Ken Shiro. It deserves a moment like this going overseas and winning winning there again. But I just think that Soto's going to get the rub of the green this weekend. And don't get me wrong, Soto can win it off his own, uh, off the strength of his own performance and his ability. He's good enough, but I ultimately think that he makes too many mistakes and he doesn't capitalise on opportunities. But I do think he can hurt Butler, so if he stops him, that wouldn't surprise me so much. But if it goes to the card, I only see one man being deserving of that victory. And for me, it's Hecky Butler. So let me know your thoughts down below, guys. If you're not familiar with the divisions, go and check them out. I definitely recommend um, Butler versus Teguchi, as I mentioned. Fantastic fight, one of the best fights of 2018, so go and check that out. And for Soto, go and check out his fight with Acosta. I think you'll learn a lot from that one. Don't watch the Jonathan Gonzalez fight because it's boring and he got schooled. So yeah, go and check that one out. So thank you for watching, guys. Thank you for supporting. Loads more predictions coming this week for the DAZN card. But until then, I will catch you next time.